Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Claire Scora. I'm a pediatric neurologist and epilepsy specialist at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange County. These will be the points that I'll address in this talk. First of all, the definition of what an EEG is, why EEGs are sometimes ordered, what are the different types of EEGs and how they're performed, and finally, an explanation of some common EEG findings. First off, what is an EEG? EEG stands for electroencephalogram, and it's a way of recording and detecting problems in electrical brainwave activity. It measures how brain cells communicate with one another, translating signals that we see between cells into wavy lines that are then interpreted, interpreted by the neurologist. This is a schematic of what an EEG looks like um, and how it's performed. The letters and numbers refer to the stickers of where the electrodes are placed on the scalp. The pointy thing at the top is a nose, um, so this is, for example, a child kind of looking up. Uh, the numbers on the right side of the page are even, um, and uh, even numbers correspond to right side of the brain, and the numbers on the left side of the page are odd, that, um, so that corresponds to the left side. The letters stand for different locations, so FP stands for frontal polar, F is for frontal, C is for central, P parietal, O occipital, T temporal, and those are the various regions of the brain, anatomically speaking. And so this is what the actual recording looks like when it's printed out onto the EEG that we interpret. And so each line on the EEG represents an electrical potential between two of those points on the scalp, which are the electrodes. So for example, if we were to draw a line here, this potential difference between FP1 and F7, if you see where that corresponds to on the actual printout, that's the top line there, FP1, F7, on the left side of the brain, sort of in the left frontal region. Here's another example if we're looking between FP2 and F8, sort of in the right frontal region that corresponds to, for example, this line on the page. And so all these lines on the page correspond to differences between two points on the scalp. So you may be wondering, why did my child's doctor order an EEG? Most commonly, EEGs are ordered for the diagnosis and monitoring of epilepsy, um, which is a disorder of recurrent unprovoked seizures. If a child has a single seizure, an abnormal EEG can be diagnostic of epilepsy. And then in a child who has a diagnosis of epilepsy, EEG can provide information about where the seizures may be arising from. It can also provide information about how well controlled seizures are. Additionally, an EEG can be ordered to evaluate for other different types of spells or abnormal behaviors that are concerning, which may or may not be seizures. An EEG can also be used to monitor brain function after, for example, severe injury. Now I'll talk a little bit about the EEG procedure itself. So usually EEGs are performed by technologists. They will place electrodes in specific locations on your child's head. Um, as you can see in the image, sort of stickers in those locations that I had detailed in the picture a few slides ago. The head may then be wrapped in a dressing to prevent the child from scratching or playing with the wires, which can interfere with the recording and the results. And the technologist may do additional tests during the study. Um, the two most common things done is hyperventilation, where we have the child breathe fast and heavy for a period of time, or photic stimulation, where we flash bright lights at the child and look at the activity in the brain as a result to that test. The setup on average takes about 30 minutes and the electrode removal is about 15 minutes and the length of recording depends on the type of EEG study ordered. The good thing about EEGs is there's no radiation and there's no shocks. It shouldn't be painful, although children may be uncomfortable or scared during the actual procedure if they don't understand what's going on. The different types of EEGs that we typically order this is um, a picture of what an EEG machine tends to look like, the actual computer. A routine EEG is what's most commonly ordered. It's usually about 30 minutes of recording. The doctor may request that your child be sleep deprived the evening before. It may or may not include video. Um, since it's a brief uh, 
procedure, sometimes we just look at the brain waves, but some of them also include video. A video EG uh, may be a few hours or it can be several days to even weeks of recording that takes place in the hospital. When a video EEG is ordered, the goal is often to capture seizures or spells and to get good long-term monitoring of what's going on in the brain. And then another type of study that's ordered is an ambulatory EEG, which is similar to a video EEG in that it's usually ordered for purposes when we want to record for longer than just 30 minutes, so we can go 24 or more hours of recording. The child will get hooked up in the EEG lab and then go home with the device and the electrodes connected, often with them in a backpack or something that's portable with the child, and then they return the next day or several days later to get unhooked. And these may or may not include video. Who reads the EEG? So some general child neurologists read EEG studies. These are doctors, um, they go to medical school and then complete a residency in child neurology, which is typically five years after medical school, and they will usually read the routine EEGs, which tend to be a little bit less involved or complicated than some of the more extended studies. Um, although most of the time, any type of EEG tends to be read by either child or adult neurologists with additional fellowship training in clinical neurophysiology and or epilepsy. And so those providers have gone to medical school, they've done residency in either child or adult neurology, and then do additional specialized training and fellowship uh, in the neurophysiology and interpretation of EEG studies. It's important to know that the individual who's reading and reporting on the EEG may not be your child's primary neurologist, and therefore may not be familiar with the child's clinical history. And this is very important when trying to interpret the report and figuring out exactly what it means for your child. It's always important to discuss the EEG results and the interpretation with your child's primary neurologist since they know your child best. When you see a report, there's a general structure that we typically follow when we uh, report on the results and we go in an organization as follows. We comment on the background activity so we try to look for different states that the child is in, wakefulness, drowsiness, and sleep. And we look for expected age-appropriate patterns and describe those in the body of the report. We also look at response to various activations that may be done, as I had mentioned, such as photic stimulation or hyperventilation. And again, we look for expected patterns of response. We then will comment on something called interictal activity, which is abnormal activity that we see between seizures. And when we look at that, we want to see were there any abnormalities that suggest there's an increased risk for seizures, and if so, where were they seen? We also may comment on ictal, which is seizure activity. And then we want to know were there any seizures during the duration of the study, and if so, where did they arise from? That's an example of a pinwheel, um, which we use in many pediatric studies because when children blow on the pinwheel, that gets them to hyperventilate, which is a, a expected response we want to see on the EEG. So now I'll go through some of the common EEG findings we see as epileptologists and give you an overview of what those uh, translate to in terms of clinical significance or relevance for your child. The most common thing we often see is a normal EEG. It's very, very common. Even in children who have epilepsy or recurrent seizures, it's not uncommon to have a normal EEG between seizures. The other reason EEGs can be normal is sometimes if a child is on anti-seizure medications, they may normalize an EEG and can mask abnormalities. Here I'm showing a picture of what a normal EEG looks like. This is in an adolescent. Um, we look at various things when we look at the waveforms, um, sort of the voltage, the frequency of activity, the organization, and to go into a lot of detail is outside the scope of this talk, but just to show you an example pictorially of what a normal study looks like. Now I'll show you an example of a, a finding we sometimes see known as generalized slowing. This is a very nonspecific finding, but we do see it relatively commonly. In general, we see slower frequency activity than expected for age in all regions of the brain. 
In general, this suggests global brain dysfunction, and it could be due to a variety of causes, some of those I've listed below, which include medications or particularly sedative medication effects. It can um, be a sign of infection or a metabolic disturbance, such as low oxygen, or it can be consistent with some structural or genetic problems. Because it's such a nonspecific finding it, and it doesn't point to a specific cause, it can't really tell you about the severity or the prognosis, it's just a finding we see. And oftentimes, as I had mentioned, the person reviewing the EEG study is not the child's primary neurologist and so can't give a great reason for why it's there, but it just describes what is seen. It may be reversible, it depends on the cause. Here's an example just to put side by side. This again is the same picture I showed of a normal EEG. And to show in comparison, this is an EEG demonstrating diffuse slowing. So each little segment on the page, the green lines represent a second. And so we look for what is that frequency of waveform activity and we see these slower waves that sort of are about occurring once every second or so. Um, in comparison to the normal study where we see some of these faster frequency activities, particularly in the posterior regions of the head. We can have generalized slowing and then we can also have focal slowing. Focal slowing again is another nonspecific finding and it indicates a brain disturbance but in just one or several regions rather than the whole brain. Common causes for these can include structural problems such as tumors, um, developmental abnormalities, which we sometimes refer to as dysplasias of structure, of brain structure, strokes. Sometimes we can see slowing of brain waves after a focal onset seizure, which I'll show in a minute. If found, the neurologist will likely want to get neuroimaging basically to see if there's something structural that reflects why the focal slowing is seen on the EEG if it hasn't already been obtained, typically a brain MRI. Here's an example of focal slowing. This is just an EEG and if we look at the top, we have the very top four lines is sort of the left frontal area um, and then you know it goes anti from the front to the back of the brain, the top sort of eight lines on here is the left side, um, then we have the middle and then the bottom eight lines refer to the right side and I'll circle right here where the abnormality is. Um, you see some of these slower waveforms that if we correspond them to what the letters and numbers, these are even numbers, so it's on the right side and the lines are sort of in the, the frontal and temporal regions. Um, so if we go back to our schematic, that's right around here on the EEG. And where does that correspond to in the brain? is sort of in the right temporal region, which is this area in red. So this is how we sort of localize issues and suspect where in the brain there may be an issue. Other common findings include epileptiform discharges, and these are abnormalities that indicate sites of brain irritability with risk for generating seizures. They can be focal in one or several specific areas or generalized, coming from all areas of the brain at once. These include things called sharp waves, spikes, and spike polyspike wave discharges. And these are some examples of what they look like schematically. A sharp wave looks a little bit like that. A spike is a little bit pointier. And then we can have a spike followed by a wave or polyspikes, which is a few of those spikes followed by an after going slow wave. Here's an example of generalized epileptiform discharges. Here you can see just about in the middle of the page there's an interruption of the background with this very high voltage activity that's seen in every single line of the page equally. And so these are generalized spike and polyspike wave discharges. Focal epileptiform discharges can also be seen. So here's an example. You can see some of these high voltage spiky things that stand out from the background circled here which correspond to focal sharp wave discharges that are in the right central and temporal regions of the brain. Sometimes on EEGs we can see seizures. Depends to on how frequently the seizures are occurring. Usually we'll see them um, on some of the more longer studies, particularly if we wean medications. 
Um, this is an example of a type of generalized seizure that we can sometimes see on routine EEGs because it can be triggered by hyperventilation or blowing on the pinwheel. And so this is a generalized absent seizure, which characteristically has rhythmic activity that you see in every lead at about three times per second, three and a half times per second. And so this is a generalized three hertz spike in wave absent seizure. It lasts about nine seconds. And typically, if children have these, they will stop blowing the pinwheel, seem to stare off, be unresponsive for the duration of these events. And then after the nine seconds are up, then they go back to what they were doing. And sometimes children can have these types of seizures hundreds of times today, a day before they're recognized. This is another example of a generalized seizure. I wanted to show this because you can see that it's so high voltage. A lot of this is due to muscle activity from a generalized shaking episode. It's hard to sometimes see the pattern, but this is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure or what many people um, comes to mind when they think of someone having a convulsive seizure. We can also see focal seizures on EEG. And so here, what we look for is a change from the background activity that looks rhythmic, and then we try to see where it's coming from. So in these lines, we can see some of these rhythmic, higher amplitude things in blue that is sort of in the T501 line, the P301, which that's on the left side, temporoparietal, occipital. If we see where it first starts, it looks to be about in the occipital. So this is a focal seizure that arises from the left occipital region. The other thing, sometimes focal seizures can start in one place and then spread to other areas of the brain. And this is a sample from that same patient. And you can see on the very left, it's sort of starting in the blue, but then it spreads down to the red, which is the right side of the brain. And so this is an example of something that started as a focal seizure and then spread to the whole brain. So in summary, EEG is an important non-invasive tool for neurologists to help diagnose and monitor epilepsy, among other conditions. Epilepsy is still a clinical diagnosis, and many children with epilepsy can have normal EEGs and still may need to be on medications. And always it's important to remember that neurologists treat your child, not just the EEG. And so it's very important when you're reading and interpreting the results to know that this should be interpreted in the context of your child's clinical story because every child is different. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day. Hi everyone, thanks so much for watching. Um, I wanted to be here for the second half of this hour um, to open it up to any questions that anybody has. Okay, so we have a question um, from Kathy. What is the average length of stay for a long-term EEG? Um, so it depends um, what, what you're looking for. Oftentimes we, we do it for 24 hours um, to guarantee that we get kind of some waking and sleep if we wanna just see a 24 hour snapshot. Um, sometimes if we're trying to capture events, um, like we're not sure if they're seizures um, or if it's something else. Sometimes we like to do 48 to 72 hours. Um, we feel a little bit better if in 
48 to 72 hours if we either haven't captured anything or, or if we have captured the event of interest, then we can answer our question. And then sometimes um, in patients that have a history of epilepsy where we really want to better localize their seizures, um, we could keep them for a week or more um, if the admission will involve something like uh, we need medications and we want to provoke seizures to see where they're coming from. Sometimes those admissions can take you know, a week or, or longer for us to get the information that we need. Thank you for the question. So this is a question um, from Renee. Could you talk a little bit about stereo EEG? Great question. And, and we didn't really um, cover that in this talk because uh, I focused on sort of non-surgical EEGs, but a stereo EEG is essentially where we put an EEG inside the brain. Um, so the electrodes are actually sort of like, uh, look a little bit like knitting needles um, that we kind of put into the brain so that we can put electrodes um, into deeper structures of the brain when we want to, we suspect there may be a deep focus that we can't detect on the scalp EEG or sometimes on the scalp EEG when, um, when seizures are very close to the midline of the brain, we can't even actually tell what side they're coming from. And so stereo EEG involves implanting deeper electrodes into the brain um, we can also, we can do it on both sides or one side, we can do it in one specific area or multiple areas to get more detailed information about where seizures are coming from. It is a surgery, um, so it involves making small burr holes um, in the scalp to inject or to put the depth electrodes, um, but it is you know, a very informative procedure that often helps us get the information we need about difficult to control seizures, particularly localizing where they're coming from. And I think there will be some talks either later today or tomorrow going into a little bit more detail about, about some of those minimally invasive surgical approaches and monitoring. Um, so take a look on the schedule for that. We can, we'll go into more detail. Any other questions from anybody? Oh, another question. How is a spike wave index calculated? Great question. Um, so a spike wave index is specifically something we calculate when we are worried about something called electrical status epilepticus of sleep, or when there's a really high burden of discharges during sleep. And so what we do actually to calculate that is we look at periods of sleep on the EEG um, and we count how many times we see uh, spike discharges in a 10 second period. And then we um, sum 10 of those periods together and then take an average of that. And it gives roughly a, a quantitative number to assess the burden of the discharges during sleep. Um, and generally, if we see that the spike wave index is higher than 80 or 90%, um, then we worry about that high burden having an effect on the child's development, um, 
learning communication skills. And so we often will treat that pattern even if they aren't having any clinical seizures.